Alors aujourd'hui, on va donc commencer avec euh, Michael Hochschild, euh, qui est euh, à distance et qui va nous parler de cet outil central dans l'évaluation des impacts environnementaux des produits et des services, qui est l'analyse de cycle de vie ACV en français ou LCA euh, en anglais. And I will do the introduction in English because uh, Michael doesn't speak French so far, or not in my not in my uh, knowledge. And I have really this uh, important pleasure to welcome uh, Michael today. He's a professor in quantitative assessment of sustainability at the Technical University of Denmark, where he leads the Center for Absolute or On Absolute Sustainability. He has worked on development of methods for sustainability assessments of products and technologies for 30 years now. And he has served as a chair on working groups from the nation, United Nations that were developing the scientific consensus on the toxicity of uh, chemicals on, for, on health and on the environment. He has acted as a consultant to the European Commission, creating the groundwork for the Commission standard methodology for life cycle assessment. He has He has uh, authored many, many research papers, more than 200. And in 2018, he, uh, was it 2018, 2015, I don't remember, he led the writing of a book, which is a life cycle assessment book, that is called by the researcher in my team, the Bible of life cycle assessment. So I'm very pleased to welcome Michael uh, today. We sometimes entitle him the Pope of life cycle assessment, although strictly speaking, the Pope did not write the Bible, so it's probably a misleading name, um, but at least he's someone very, very important in life cycle assessment. So we are really happy that he could uh, make us in between a very busy day uh, today for him to be here available to uh, teach us and train us and, uh, on this very important method that is life cycle assessment and have a bridge to his more recent, I would say, uh, research Uh, direction, which is on the absolute evaluation of sustainability and not only a relative evaluation of sustainability. So, Michael, uh, thank you very much for being here with us. And you have a talk time of uh, two hours, including questions, so probably a bit less than two hours for the, for the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this overwhelming uh, introduction. Uh, I never heard that before, but uh, but thank you very much. Uh, I'll try if I can, can live up uh, to some of the expectations here. So unfortunately, I'm not able to be together with you. That would have been uh, probably a, a lot better. Uh, but but uh, as you heard, I mean, this is a very busy time just up to Christmas, so it wasn't really possible for me to come. So maybe maybe some other time. We'll see. Uh, but I would like to uh, just uh, jump into it because uh, we have a busy schedule ahead of us. Uh, and the, the way that I've outlined my uh, presentation is the following. Uh, first, I will Uh, as an introduction, talk about the sustainability challenge that we are facing. And as I'm from a technical university, uh, I would like to see, can we quantify this somehow? So we all have an understanding or a feeling that a lot of things are not going the right way at the moment. But what is actually the, the, the challenge that we're facing in, in more quantitative terms? And then I'll introduce you to the concept of eco-efficiency and how we measure that with LCA. Uh, I'll briefly uh, introduce you to the history of LCA and some of the applications of LCA or, or analysis de cycle de vie, uh, as you heard, and um, and then take you through some of the uh, methodological elements, just briefly give you an introduction to uh, the methodological phases of the LCA and some of the core aspects of LCA methodology. Uh, and then, and this will definitely be after the break, uh, I will uh, introduce you to these thoughts about absolute sustainability assessment and, and why uh, we have found that it's necessary to introduce an absolute perspective in sustainability assessment. And I'll give you uh, a little bit details on, on, on how we do that and also one example at the end. Uh, but I'll speed up and then, uh, of course, if there are some pressing questions as we go along, Uh, I mean, more of understanding character, then uh, I guess that uh, it may be posted in the chat or something, but, but otherwise I'll, I'll try to speed up so we can have some time for discussions uh, at the end. So uh, let's get uh, let's get on with it here. First about the sustainability challenge. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the iPad equation, uh, this one here. Uh, notice it's a T, not a D up there, so it's nothing to do with the Apple product. Uh, but the iPad equation is a way of analyzing our pressure on the environment as a function of three drivers, uh, three of the drivers behind it, 
uh, namely, um, let me just see here, uh, P, the population, A, the affluence of that population, and T, a technology factor, as it's called. Uh, it's, it's really the environmental intensity of the technology, the environmental impact per created value. So the, the thinking behind this, uh, behind this equation is that uh, if you have, a, uh, if you have uh, a doubling of the population, uh, then all others equal, the environmental impact that is caused by the activities of that population will also double. Uh, and if you have a given population and you increase the affluence, the material standard of living of that population, uh, then you will also increase the environmental impact. Unless you can do something about T, the technology factor, the environmental intensity of the technology. So if you can improve your technology, make it more efficient in, in environmental terms so that you can deliver the same affluence with lower environmental impact, uh, then you can, of course, reduce the environmental impact even if the affluence goes up. That's the thinking behind decoupling, and we'll come back to that. And there's a specific version of this where A, the affluence, because how do you measure affluence? Uh, I mean, it could be the number of products that we each have, uh, but the Gradle and Allen being in 1995 in their industrial ecology suggested that we represent it by GDP per person, the gross domestic product per person, which is frequently used to measure the wealth of nations, for instance. So we compare different nations, are they wealthy, are they less wealthy? Uh, GDP per person is often used, it's also often criticized, it's not a good measure of well-being at least, it's a measure of the total economic activity uh, of the country. But but if we take that as measure of the affluence, because it is a, you know, it's certainly uh, correlated with that, then the technology factor has to be impact per GDP, because otherwise the equation is false, as you can see uh, by shortening it out. Uh, but. But, but what does that then mean? Well, if we look at the current situation, we can say that we have a population that is growing globally. Uh, we are at the moment at 8.2 billion people on the planet, roughly. And uh, population forecasts predict that it may level off around 10 billion people towards the middle of this century. So it is growing. Population is growing. The material standard of living is also growing, the GDP per person. And it will grow, it must grow strongly in, in many of the newly industrialized uh, countries of, of, the, uh, of the global south, uh, where there's, of course, from a social sustainability point of view, a strong need for growth in certain sectors to enable, uh, to enable the citizens to get access to electricity, for instance, and, and, and health services and infrastructure, what have you. And the environmental impact is already exceeding sustainable levels in, in many fields. Uh, we know about the climate change. Uh, where we have the Paris Agreement, uh, many countries have committed to reducing their uh, climate change impact strongly. We just uh, came out of the COP28 uh, meeting and so forth. So what is actually the challenge if we look at the technology factor? Well, let's take the example of climate change. Let's stay a bit with that and then look at the development from 2020 to 2030 uh, that is requested uh, according to this iPad equation. So if we isolate the technology factor, the environmental intensity of the technology, T, as, as we've done here, how can, what, what would be the challenge for the development or the needed development in the technology factor from 2020 to 2030? Let's first look at the impact. Um, these graphs are from uh, a report, uh, IPCC report in 2018, uh, which is, uh, it's called a 1.5 degree report where the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change propose uh, a whole range of different uh, future development scenarios that will allow us uh, to uh, keep the Paris Agreement or meet the, uh, the ambitions of the Paris Agreement, uh, so limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees with no overshoot or limited overshoot, and also some pathways with a higher overshoot, and then, of course, uh, net zero uh, impacts around 2050. And you can see that uh, they, we have need for very strong reductions. Um, and this is, as I said, from 2018, this report. So it predicts that just after 2018, we'll see a strong reduction. We're now in 23, uh, we haven't seen it yet. So of course the need for reductions has not been smaller. But if we try to take this and say, what is the, what is the challenge from uh, 2020 to 2030? We can say that we need uh, to go from somewhere around 40, gigat 40 gigatons of CO2 uh, per year down to around 20. So I, the impact 
has to be uh, has to be uh, half in 2030 of what it was in 2020. So 0.5. Okay. Um, so what then about the population? Well, here we have a number of uh, population forecasts from uh, United Nations uh, Population Division. Uh, and you can see a very wide range of potential future developments uh, that we'll not go into now. But if we just look at the development from 2020 to 2030, we can say that uh, we will grow from 7.8 billion people in 2020 to 8.7 billion people in 2030, so roughly 10%. So the uh, population number in 2030 will be 1.1 times what it was in 2020. And then what about the affluence? Well, if we measure it uh, by GDP per person, we have historical numbers uh, for the global uh, GDP per person back from, yeah, even before 1960. But if we look at these numbers that, that we can find uh, from the World Bank, um, we can see that we have per decade increased the global GDP per person, and this is corrected for purchasing uh, power. So uh, these numbers are uh, comparable in the purchasing power. Um, we can see that it has varied quite a lot over the time, uh, but overall, if we assume a factor 1.3, that means that the GDP per person in 2030 will be 30% higher than it was in 2020. That is a rather conservative assumption, but let's go with that. So the affluence in 2030 measured as GDP per person will be 1.3 times what it was in 2020. And that means that the technology factor in 2030 has to be 0.35. That's roughly a third of what it was in 2020. That means that overall across all the technology that we use in 2030, uh, we need uh, to have an environment intensity, which is a third of what it was in 2020. So, of course, for some technologies, this is in, uh, not complicated to achieve. Uh, for others, this is quite a challenge. In Denmark, we're discussing very much what is the role of the agriculture and how are they going to deliver what they need, whereas our electricity sector, for instance, in Denmark, will probably be fully decarbonized in 2030. At least that is the plan. Uh, and so, so that's, of course, much more than this. But these are the challenges for climate change. I took the example of climate change because this is a, this is an, an area which is, of course, very important, but also an area where we have quite good knowledge. We know how much we impact at the moment. We also have an agreement of what would be considered sustainable or could be considered sustainable. Of course, you can challenge the 1.5 degree target, whether that is sufficiently ambitious. Uh, we have the 350.org uh, uh, NGO saying this is really where we should go for, uh, whereas, you know, uh, uh, 1.5 degrees is probably more like 450 parts per million carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere and not, uh, and not three, 350 as, uh, as might also be claimed is what is sustainable. And this is what's of course climate change, but it's not just about climate change. Uh, we are at the moment losing species. This is from the IPBS uh, uh, consensus report 2019, uh, where the uh, IPBS is, is a parallel of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just on biodiversity, uh, and where they map the, the, uh, the cumulative loss of species um, with a background rate of 0.1 to 2 extinctions per million species per year. And these, these rates of species loss since 1800s something, at least early 1900s, where you can see it really takes off, um, has been at a at a, a size that we have, it's not unprecedented in the history of the planet. We've seen it, uh, or we have observed five times before where you can find in geological sediments and so forth, that we in a short period of time, a few hundred years, thousand years maybe, have lost a lot of species. So you have a very high extinction rate uh, five times before, the fifth time was was uh, 65 million years ago when the the big uh, uh, reptiles, the the, the um, uh, dinosaurs and so forth, became extinct, probably as a consequence of a collision uh, with an asteroid. And we are now losing species at the same rate as this time or the other uh, four times before that has been observed these mass extinction episodes. 
Uh, and this is what leads biodiversity researchers to talk about that we are uh, at the moment probably in the sixth mass extinction episode of the planet, at least that we know of. And uh, this time, the reason, of course, is not collision with an asteroid, uh, but with the human, the human species. It's our appropriation of land and water, particularly, but also our pollution of the environment with chemicals, nutrients, microplastics, what have you. And then, of course, also climate change. So it's not just about climate change, but climate change is, is a good calculation. It's also a driver behind this, uh, this bio, uh, biosphere uh, integrity uh, impact. So factor three improvements by 2030, is that at all possible? Well, before we dig into that, it might be useful to talk about how do we actually measure the technology factor. And the point is, we typically in, in in, in this field, do not talk about the technology factor outside the iPad equation. Instead, we talk about eco-efficiency. So eco-efficiency can be defined as the ratio for a given technology or a given activity. The eco-efficiency can be defined as the ratio between what you get out of it, the delivered service or technology, for instance, transportation technology, to uh, support the com uh, the commuting of a population of uh, a million people uh, daily uh, over a year or whatever for, for you to bring you from A to B. That could be the delivered service for a, a transport uh, uh, system, food system, of course, meeting the nutritional needs of a population of a certain uh, size and, and composition. So th the ratio between the delivered service of the technology and the environmental impact that this technology causes and as such, you can see that this is actually the reciprocal of the technology factor from the iPad equation, which was the other way around. It was the impact per, in this case, GDP, which you can say is, is also a way of measuring uh, the service you get out, the value you get out of the technology. So uh, basically, you can say that uh, if you increase if, uh, or improve the eco-efficiency, it means you create more value with less environmental impact. And how do we measure eco-efficiency? Well, we measure it using life cycle assessment because life cycle assessment, as I'll come back to shortly, is really about, when we're talking about comparative life cycle assessments, comparing different ways of obtaining the same service. So if you want to find out whether it's, uh, it's better, it's more eco-efficient uh, to transport yourself from home to work in a battery-driven electric vehicle or a combustion engine-driven electric vehicle, for instance, then you have to start defining the service. What is the service you get out of it? What is the transportation work you get out of it? And then based on that, we call it the functional unit of the LCA, and I'll come back to that. Based on that, uh, we then identify the systems that need to be, be compared, and then we quantify the environmental impact of these two. So you can say we fix the service, the delivered service, and then we see what are the impacts of doing it, of obtaining this service in one way or the other way or a third way, maybe. Uh, so LCA is a tool to measure it. But what are the kinds of questions we are asking to a life cycle assessment? Well, it could be, for instance, is organic food more eco-efficient than conventional uh, produced food, you know, with, uh, with the uh, uh, use of uh, fertilizers, uh, uh, with the use of pesticides and so forth? Uh, is that the case for all types of environmental impact? So, of course, it, it is the case for the toxicity to the environment in the sense that we are not allowed in organic uh, food production to use uh, pesticides that are very toxic to the environment. If they uh, get into the environment, they are designed to, to kill life, pesticides. Uh, but is it also for other types of environmental impacts the case? Some, uh, many studies show that you have lower yields in organic uh, agriculture than you have in conventional agriculture. And that means that if you want to achieve the same yield, you need to, to uh, uh, cultivate a larger area. You need a, a more, more field area. And that, of course, has uh, environmental impacts as well, because if you need more land for agriculture, you will eventually have to turn uh, natural land into agricultural land. And that may be a consequence. And that, of course, has some dramatic consequences as, as well on the thriving of the ecosystems and on, in the end on, on the biodiversity. So that could be one type of question. Another example, how important is transport and distribution actually compared to production? Uh, supposing that, uh, that it is more uh, eco-efficient to produce organic tomatoes than produce uh, conventional tomatoes, what about if these organic tomatoes are produced in Spain and transported uh, to, uh, to Leuven or Louvain? 
uh, as opposed to produced locally, but with conventional methods. Uh, how important is this transport distribution actually compared to the production? And what about the packaging? There's a lot of focus on packaging. Actually, the history of LCA started very much with packaging studies because there's a big visibility there and there's a big focus on that. How important is the packaging in this respect? Which raw materials contribute most to the total environmental impact of the product? That can be very useful if you, I mean, so eco design considerations, all of them are actually, uh, you know, where should you focus? And if we stay in the in the food field, also a question like, is this diet sustainable? Not yet more, not not just more eco efficient than something else, but sustainable. Would it be sustainable if everybody in the planet had to meet their dietary needs with such a diet? How much meat can we eat, for for instance, and and then still enable everybody on the planet to meet their dietary needs? And in order to answer questions like that, we need to take a life cycle perspective. So this is the uh, part of the life cycle of a food product where you can see we have uh, in the beginning of this uh, semicircle here, we have uh, the resource extraction. Uh, in the case of, of agricultural products, it's, it, it, it's of course the cultivation of, of the crops, the raising of the animals if it's uh, animal husbandry, but it can also be extraction of resources, uh, metals and oil, fossil resources that you need uh, to run your machinery, for instance. Then we have a transport of the harvested uh, product uh, to a grain mill, for instance, or a slaughterhouse if it's an animal. You have a, tr a, a transport of the processed raw materials to the food production um, where you uh, produce your food product. And this is then where the life cycle of the food product means the life cycle of the packaging that also starts with extraction of resources, production of materials, production of packaging products, if you like, that then meet the food products here at the food production and is distributed to the retailer where you go down or drive down in this case in your car, you pick up the product, you take it home, you store it in your refrigerator and you consume it or rather, of course, part of it you don't consume, but you actually dispose of it. Uh, so it goes to landfill, it goes to composting, maybe incineration, or maybe we manage to close the loop somehow uh, in order to uh, you know, support what we call a circular economy here, particularly for the packaging materials. Uh, the EU has a strong focus on uh, recycling of, for instance, plastics and car cardboard. So you can take the packaging material and you can see if you can recycle it, if you can uh, take the material out, get the plastic polymer back, get the cardboard back and use it for producing new packaging or maybe some other product of it. And of course, also some of the food waste, uh, you, can, you can imagine that you can use, uh, you can recycle it maybe into animal food uh, or things like that. Um, and uh, in, in case you're wondering, uh, the numbers tell us that globally food waste is a roughly a third of what is produced. So a third of what is produced up here is never consumed. It ends up being being wasted. Different parts in the whole value chain here. So part of it, of course, because we throw it out, but a lot of it also, particularly for tropical crops, uh, because it's lost after harvest, it's very difficult to keep it and to really get it into the system. Now, you may of course say, okay, uh, we have uh, this packaging, uh, a big part of the impact from, from, from food production comes from this packaging. We could, uh, we could reduce the environmental impact, uh, increase the eco-efficiency of our food production system by reduce the amount of packaging. Uh, but of course, packaging has, has many purposes, but a very important one is to maintain uh, the, the food fresh, protect it, and ensure that it doesn't end up as waste. So if you cut down on the packaging, and thereby save impact from the extraction of resources for packaging and the production and transport of the packaging, you will eventually induce need for additional food production of the food item itself. So you can save something on the packaging life cycle, but then induce impact on the, on the food product life cycle. And in order to discover things like that and find out what is actually the most eco-efficient solution that, that, you know, meets the nutritional uh, needs of me or my population, um, what is the most eco-efficient uh, way of doing this? Uh, you need to take this uh, uh, systems perspective. To avoid problem shifting where you can say, okay, we solve some of the environmental problems associated with producing the packaging, but then we induce 
additional need for uh, production of, of the food uh, items themselves. Uh, and then we should just shift the problem. So we shift the problem from one location in the life cycle to another location in the life cycle. Uh, it's also uh, relevant or important to consider all relevant types of impacts. Uh, I mentioned before the example of, of uh, organic food production, where you have less ecotoxic impacts, for instance, because you don't use pesticides. Uh, on the other hand, you may have uh, higher land use related impacts because you need more land if that is the case. And that means, again, you have the you have the possibility of the risk of problem shifting that you address a, one type of environmental impact, but then and you reduce that, but then you increase another one. A, a classical example uh, when we're talking climate change is that you you say, OK, we, we want to avoid burning fossil fuels, so we need to produce biofuels instead, say sustainable aviation fuel. I heard uh, this new term SAF. Uh, which to a large extent so far is uh, perceived by the aviation industry as being biofuels. And you can say, okay, but then we need to produce more materials for biofuels. Uh, where are they going to come from? That's of course going to induce an extra land use. If we suddenly, apart from our food production, need to, need to produce uh, feedstocks for producing biofuels, bioethanol, for instance, or biodiesel. So that's another example where you can say you, you, you make a uh, shifting from climate change impacts to land use impacts in this case. And we need to be able to address the trade-offs between these impacts. Uh, and this is what the life cycle assessment aims to enable us to do. If we take a very brief history of it, uh, uh, it's a very young discipline, or oh, not that young anymore, because actually I, I've been in the field for 30 years and, and it was a young discipline when I started, but it has its early roots back in the 1960s where it started actually with packaging studies. Uh, Coca-Cola was one of the first companies uh, asking for studies of their packaging. Uh, and then it was a bit dormant in the 70s and up to the mid 80s where packaging studies again came up and, and uh, a, a larger number of studies were performed identifying the need for some standardization because uh, remember at the time there were, uh, I remember five big national studies of milk packaging was the most eco-efficient way of packaging milk uh, and and uh, they they investigated more or less the same alternatives and came up with five different answers and that's of course not very useful and and reason for that was partly that they were done very differently these life cycle assessments so uh, under the uh, society of environmental toxicology and chemistry uh, ctac uh, back in the uh, early 90s uh, at, at the methodological discussion was launched a code of conduct was developed and that it was the basis of development of ISO, ISO uh, standards for life cycle assessments in the 1990s. Uh, and, and they've now been updated to these two standards, ISO 14,040 and 14,044, both from the um, environmental management standards series 14,000, uh, which are really uh, standardizing the methodological foundation. And then uh, we saw a strong surge in the use of LCA, uh, we have different types of footprints, carbon footprint that uh, you, you probably know about, uh, which is basically the climate change impact in the whole life cycle of, the, of, of your product. Uh, but ecological footprint is another one looking into the use of land uh, or, or biosphere capacity and, um, uh, and uh, also climate is involved in the ecological footprint, water footprint, the same uh, embodied water in the product. So taking a value chain or life cycle perspective on your product and then quantifying the impacts uh, of different kinds. So this is these are life cycle thinking and there are ISO standards for both uh, the carbon footprint and the uh, the water footprint or at least technical reports on this under ISO 4040. It was used a lot also in eco design. Uh, my own entrance into the field in 1992 was actually a big product de a project developing both LCA methodology, but also methods for taking the learnings from using LCA into eco design and combining the two uh, into uh, development of uh, less environmentally impacting products. This was uh, the eco design. It's used a lot of for that in companies to focus to find out where are the main uh, drivers of environmental impact in the life cycle? What should we focus on? And also, of course, then to uh, document the improvements that have been achieved. Uh, so you can go out and tell we did this and we are so much better than we were before. And then 
our competitors. And this led into eco labeling and in realms of product declarations, EPDs, um, where standards have also been developed back in the 90s and early zeros uh, for, for this, the ISO 40,020 series, uh, specifying again, you need to take a life cycle perspective if you want to uh, you know, market your product as being greener than something else. And then uh, some of the later developments have been the uh, uh, EU guidelines, the product in rhymes of footprint and the organizational environment of footprint PEF and OEF guidelines um, for specifying how, according to the, to the commission, you should uh, do an LCA. But basically, they are all based on the ISO standard. And what you see here is the framework uh, of the ISO uh, standard for life cycle assessment. So it identifies a number of methodological phases uh, basically, uh, starting with the goal definition, where you say for your LCA, what's the question? Why do you do this LCA? What is the question you would like to have an answer to? And if this is the question, then what is the system you should study? Where are the boundaries of the study of, of, of your system, and, and and how should you form your methodology? How should you uh, how should you uh, uh, how should you shape your methodology with me which methodological choices do you make that needs to be in accordance with your goal definition and then when you've done that you start collecting data for your system what are the flows uh, between the processes in the life cycle that you have now scoped or product system we also sometimes call it what are the flows between these the the surroundings the environment uh, and and the processes uh, into the processes uh, raw materials resources and out of the processes uh, in terms of environmental uh, emissions, data for all the processes in the whole life cycle. And then when you've done that, uh, you do an impact assessment to find out, okay, now we know what are the emissions from the whole life cycle here associated with uh, with this uh, product or obtaining this function. Uh, what are the impacts associated with that? And then finally, you do an interpretation where you go back and look at your question that formed the whole assessment and say, how do, how do we then answer this question based on the, the findings I, I have now uh, from the earlier phases in the life cycle assessment, what is then the answer and how certain is it, is it? And as you notice, there are a lot of arrows going back and forth in this diagram. That's because there's a lot of iteration uh, going on. So you don't just start with a goal definition and then you proceed to the interpretation and finish. Uh, you go back and revisit your earlier choices, uh, your earlier uh, data, uh, in the light of later findings. So when you do your impact assessment, you find out what actually the, the important parts here, and then you go back and, and qualify them. But we'll come back to that. So let's start in the scope definition with the functional unit. I'm, I'm just going to take you through a few of the central elements of LCA that are really important. There's, of course, a lot more in it. We're teaching a 10 ECTS uh, credits uh, course here at DTU every autumn. Uh, where we, we teach uh, the students to, to do LCA, actually do LCA, working in a, a commercial software uh, like Simapro or um, um, OpenLCA or, or, or whatever. Um, so this has to be a quick snap snapshot, but the functional unit is very important. When you do a comparative LCA where you're comparing different alternatives, um, alternative ways of obtaining a certain service, you start with a service you do a quantitative description of the service that is provided by the product system. So in my example with the food uh, system before, um, what is the service that it provides? So you need to say, okay, uh, did, this could be to meet the annual nutritional needs of a population uh, like the Danish, for instance, or the Belgian. Uh, and then uh, then you have some numbers on there. So, so, so uh, you can say how many people and what is it they need, what's the population, the age distribution and so forth. You can go in and you can quantify that. But if you take it a bit step back, basically what we do is we, we identify obligatory properties and positioning properties of the, the way we obtain this service. Obligatory properties are properties that you can say it needs to fulfill this. If it doesn't fulfill this, if we take the food example from before, um, there is a certain nutritional requirement, depending on your level of activity and, and your age and so forth. Uh, you need this many calories. You need this much protein of this and that composition, uh, and you need this many lipids and vitamins and minerals and what have you. So these are obligatory properties. If, you don't, if it doesn't fulfill that, it does not meet the purpose. 
for the service, doesn't provide the service we want. And then, of course, there are positioning properties, which if we talk ordinary products, are the properties of the product that would make you prefer that one to another one. They both fulfill the obligatory properties, otherwise they don't qualify as, as being relevant alternatives. Uh, but but there's something that makes you choose this product rather than the other. Of course, if we're talking about nutritional, it's clearly, it, it, you know, it would be uh, the, the gastronomic uh, uh, qualities of, uh, of, the, of the diet, because there are many different diets that can, that can meet our nutritional needs, but, but some of them are perhaps more delicious to our taste than others. Uh, so that would be positioning provinces. If we're talking other products, well, I can tell you back in the 60s, uh, when I grew up as a child, there were no safety belts in the cars. Uh, that became an obligatory property uh, in the uh, late 70s, I think, in Denmark, 80s, maybe not, I think, 70s. But this was a positioning property in the 60s uh, that, you, you know, OK, this car has a safety belt. Wow, that's a very secure car. ABS brakes is another example from cars. It used to be a positioning property, and now it's turned into an obligatory property. So this is also to demonstrate that this is actually a moving field. But But you have to, you know, think into this and then, to, 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 to specify in your functional unit, what is it that's provided and what is the extent and the duration? So the example with the diet, what's the extent? Well, that was the Belgian population. So, so many million people. And what's the duration? For one year. Uh, let me give you another example, uh, the uh, example of an outdoor wall paint. So we have, a let's say, a wooden wall and we want to paint it, it's facing north. Uh, which uh, on this uh, northern hemisphere means, uh, oh, sorry, it's facing south, so it's facing towards the, the sun. And uh, and what you would do here is you would say, hey, what what is it? What's the what what's the obligatory property? That is to to protect this south-facing wooden wall against weathering and giving it a desired, let's say, red color. That's what's provided. What is the extended duration? Well, the extent could be 100 square meters. You need to specify that and the duration, 10 years. And this means that if you compare different different paints would then be your product. I mean, you need a, that would typically be the way. In principle, you could coat it with a, you know, plastic, uh, uh, a plastic membrane, but let's assume you obtain this function by two paints and you have a thin paint, very water uh, containing, not a lot of solids in it. Uh, and, uh, and then you have a much thicker one uh, with a much more, with, with much more, uh, solids in it and uh, and of course uh, producing the latter has a much higher impact per liter but what's important here is that you don't want to compare one liter to the other you want to take the step back and say what is the function that it provides and how much do i need of the thin water uh, rich one uh, in order to obtain this and here you need maybe you know to apply three times before you have the coating and then it only lasts for two years so you need to reapply it every two years so five times so that means five times, let's say you need a liter per, per 100 square meters here for each application. So that's five times three liters. You need 15 liters of a thin paint. Whereas the thick paint, you also need a liter for 100 square meters, but you only need to apply it once. Uh, and then you it lasts for five years uh, because it's much more quality in it. Uh, so that means you need to apply it twice and you only need one liter. So that means two liters. So the relevant comparison here is two liters of the thick paint versus 15 liters of the thin paint. And that is then the comparison you'll do in your LCA. They, you know, meet the same needs. They both fulfill or give you the function, describing the functional unit. But this is super important to find out what is it that's relevant to compare here, not a liter to a liter, but in this case, two liters to 15 liters. The functional unit allowed you to find out about that. So for comparative life cycle assessments, and that's very frequently what LC is used for, this is uh, really central. Another point here is a challenge is the infinity of the life cycle. Uh, let's take the steel and coal example. If you want to produce steel, you need iron pellets, so you need iron ore, and then you need coal. But in order to produce coal, you need machinery like this, which is made from steel. So to produce steel, you need iron ore and coal, but to produce coal, you need steel. And to produce that steel, you need iron ore and coal. And to produce that coal, 
you need steel. So you can see, you 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 know, it it it, it opens up, and you have actually an infinite system in prin in principle that goes back in time and out in scale, and that's of course not super. Uh, uh, easy or re relevant to do an LCA if you have to include the whole uh, the history of the whole industrialization of our culture. So you need to find some way of addressing this. How can you do that? You need to cut off some of your systems. You, you need to stop at a certain point. The question is, is it relevant to include the steel that's needed for the machinery that's used for extracting the coal? Or if you go further step back, what, how far back do you have to go? And the answer is very simple. You can leave out everything that doesn't matter, which of course makes a lot of sense. I mean, why would you consider the things that don't matter? The problem is to find out what matters and what does not matter. And matters mean, is it able to influence the answer to the question that you started posing in your goal definition, your conclusion on the LCA? If it is able to influence that, then you need to include it. If not, you can you can exclude it. But that basically need, means that you need to have actually to have an idea of the total impact of the system before you can decide whether it's important to include it or not. So in principle, you need to know the answer of the LCA before you can scope it. And that's of course a challenge. How are we addressing that? Well, basically it takes us back to the fact that LCA is an iterative exercise. So we start by defining our goal and scope, and then we collect data for this process, this, this whole product system. And then we do our first impact assessment. And this first collection of data, we use, we use default data, we use data that's available in lifecycle uh, inventory databases. There's a lot of data available now for, for, for the different types of processes you have uh, in, in the lifecycle. We have particularly uh, EcoInvent, a, a big uh, Swiss database originally uh, with hundreds of thousands of process data in there for all kinds of different processes. So. Uh, for, for the big ones, the materials, different types of materials, transportation processes, uh, electricity production and so forth, there is data already. You go in and you use the data you can find in processes like that, uh, process databases like that. You use the data that you have, maybe from the company that you're doing the LCA for, if it's for a company. And then you make uh, your good estimates of data for the processes where you don't have any data. And then you do your impact assessment. And that impact assessment then enlightens your goal and scope definition, actually, to go back and say, okay, I was considering, can I exclude this process? Can I not exclude this process? So I included it, and then I just used some uh, default data. And now I can see that in the total picture, even if the data is a factor 10 higher than what I assumed, it is still insignificant. Well, then it's probably safe to assume that it's out of your system. But you revise your scope, you go back and you collect data again. You also focus on the processes that the first impact assessment showed you are dominating. So you do sensitivity analysis here. Uh, and then you find out these are the dominating processes. Do I have good data or are they very uncertain? Because if you have dominating processes, processes where you have a large sensitivity uh, that are very uncertain, you have a problem. So then you need to focus on that in your second iteration. So you collect new data for these processes and then you do your impact assessment again and you repeat your sensitivity study and find out where are the drivers of the processes now, what are the hotspots in the life cycle, do I have good data there? If I don't, I collect data on these specifically in the third iteration and so forth. And you go on like that in, until you can say the remaining uncertainty now is so small that it cannot change my conclusion. If my purpose is to find out if it's better to do A than to do B, you go on until you can say, now the remaining uncertainty is so small that it cannot change my conclusion. A is better than B, for instance, even if all the remaining uncertainty falls out in favor of uh, B, A is still better. So this is the idea in the iteration. This is actually an art because you start getting an overview and then you zoom in on what seems to matter. You improve that and then you zoom out again, say, okay, where are now the hotspots? And then you zoom in on them. So this is what is called a bottom-up LCA or process-based LCA. So you do a detailed analysis of all the processes in the life cycle. Here we have examples of these processes. It could be a manufacturing process, flow injection molding, for instance, could be a transportation process, could be a mining process, what have you, waste management process. 
you have some raw materials or products going in, energy maybe, water, what have you. You have emissions coming out, waste coming out, and a processed product coming out. And, and for all these processes, you collect the data uh, about these flows and compile them in a lifecycle inventory. But there's another approach. Yeah, we could first say the strength of this is, of course, it's very specific for your individual product because you are looking at the processes that are in the life cycle of your product and you're trying to get data for these processes or good proxy data. The weakness is the cutoff I just mentioned that you need to leave out some. You cannot include everything because then it's the whole world. Uh, and and, and uh, you may be missing data uh, for some of these background data processes and then have to make crude assumptions that can be different for you to validate. So there's an alternative to that, which is the top-down LCA, which is based on input-output uh, statistics. So if you're familiar with input-output statistics, it is uh, it's an economic uh, tool that you have. Uh, so different uh, in, uh, countries pr uh, produce input-output statistics where you have information about how different sectors in the economy uh, uh, trade with each other. And, um, um, and the, the beauty of this is that you have here the example, the agriculture, this is compiled a lot. You have many more sectors than this. You typically have 150 sectors maybe in an economy. Uh, the US is, is even more, more than 300 sectors. But here you can see that agriculture uh, uh, buys this much from agriculture, this much from industry, this much from building. And industry buys this much from agriculture. So you have the same that in order to produce an agricultural product, you need input from industry that needs input from agriculture, that needs input from in industry and so forth. Same problem as before. But uh, Vasily Leontiev, a Russian mathematician, I think in 1958 or thereabout, got the Nobel Prize in economy for solving this. There is a, there is a, 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 a full solution to this uh, by matrix inversion. Uh, you can actually uh, solve. This is a, an infinite row that you can come up with uh, with an analy analytical solution to. So you don't need to cut off anything. And that's wonderful. The problem is that the data here is economic. So we can see for how many euros does agriculture actually buy from agriculture, from industry, from building and so forth, and vice versa. What we're interested in is environmental impacts. So if you buy, uh, I mean, how much impact of the on the agricultural product on the food products come from industry from what they buy in industry and so forth so you somehow need to link this economic input output statistics to environmental impacts and this is done in what is called environmentally extended input output statistics eeio uh, that allows us to solve it analytically and get the exact number the big strength is that we include all transactions between sectors the weaknesses of this is that what you have is basically eco-efficiency data. So you have the information how much CO2 is emitted for every euro you buy from this sector. But this is average for the whole sector. And some of these sectors are very heterogeneous. So you just get an average number for the sector that may vary orders of magnitude. So you can be quite wrong, you know, if the product that you buy from the sector is in the worst end or in the best end. So this is one problem. Another problem is that it, it has a quite poor coverage of many of the elementary flows. So it's reasonably good for carbon dioxide, I guess. It's completely hopeless for toxic impacts, for instance. And with this, I guess we may want to uh, to have a break. I don't hear anything. Yeah, I'm here. So we were okay, not, good. We were not really planning for a break. Indeed, if, in case if you need, we can. I don't need a break. Okay. Uh, and I cannot see you, but I, I don't see anyone lying over that table. So I guess uh, <laughs> no, we, we were, could still. We were uh, shooting for the session of two hours in a row, except if the audience would like to have a break. Cool. I think we can continue because uh, Michael certainly has a lot of material and if we don't have a break, I think you have to have to cover everything at the same pace, which is not too too high, which is perfect. So let's okay. continue this I'll way. Thank, Thank you very you. much. That's good news for me. Then maybe I can make it. We'll see. Okay. Good. So these were some, these were some aspects from the um, scope definition 
and from the inventory analysis that are quite central. You And you will meet, I mentioned this with the bottom up and top down. Uh, as I said, bottom up is also called process LCA. That's kind of the classical uh, LCA uh, based on big unit process databases. Input output LCA or top down LCA is often used particularly for climate. Uh, so for uh, carbon footprints, if you have seen you know, reports telling about, we, we recently had a report coming out in Denmark telling about the carbon footprint of the typical Dane. So where do our consumption-based impacts come from? So not the national emission related, what are the greenhouse gas emissions of Denmark? I mean, the territorial emissions, but the emissions associated with our consumption. So how much comes from all the stuff that we import, for instance? Uh, this kind of studies are, are normally done uh, with input output. And as I said, for climate change, I think they are okay, uh, reasonably uh, useful. The problem when you want to move into pro product LCAs is that it becomes very unspecific. So this was the strength of the process LCA or the bottom up approach that is very specific to your product. And of course, uh, the, the beauty here for us as engineers is to combine the two approaches to use, see if we can we somehow use the strengths of input output LCA together with the strengths of process based LCA. And, and there are approaches called hybrid uh, LCAs that, that, uh, that try to, can you say, combine the strengths of the two. Okay, but now we have compiled data about the, the flows. Uh, the exchanges between the processes uh, in the life cycle and the surroundings. Uh, and um, that's very nice. Uh, but but in order to answer our question, is it better to do A than B? Uh, is it better to uh, meet the nutritional needs by uh, organic or conventional uh, farming? Is it better to drive an electric car than a, a fossil-based uh, car and so forth? We need to translate these emissions into environmental impact because there are hundreds if not thousands of emissions and some of them are really serious and some of them are not at all serious and uh, and there we zoom in on the potential that these uh, exchanges between our product system our processes and the environment uh, the potentials that they have to impact on the environment and contribute to the environmental problems that we know so what we do is that we, we, we study the environmental impact through the life cycle and we start identifying what are potential impacts that we are worried about. And that's, of course, the climate change and the greenhouse effect that causes it. Could be the degradation of stratospheric ozone, could be the depletion of non-renewable resources. These are global impacts. And that means that the underlying environmental mechanism, the impact pathway behind it that connects the emission to damage on the environment is global of nature. That means it does not matter where you emit uh, carbon dioxide or one of the other greenhouse gases, the contribution to climate change is the same. It doesn't mean that the damages occur equally across the planet as we are seeing already very much now. Some regions are much more hit than others, but the mechanism behind it is global. It does not matter where you emit it. But that is not the case when we're talking about the regional impact categories like acidification, uh, enrichment with nutrients, uh, you know, damaging our coastal waters, causing oxygen depletion and so forth. It's very prominent if you have a lot of agriculture, toxicity to ecosystems and humans, uh, photochemical air pollution, particle borne air pollution. We hear about millions of people dying every year prematurely uh, in big cities, particularly in, in Southeast Asia as a consequence of particle air pollution. What you see in the picture here to the right is what used to be a forest in Bohemia. Uh, this picture is from 1988. And this is, uh, well, it's dead. There's, there's no life left. This uh, was caused by acidification. So uh, acid rain, pollution of the atmosphere with nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides that turn into acids there and, and rain down and, and destroy uh, the, uh, the life with different uh, mechanisms. Today, there is a forest here again. So this was cut away. The forest was replanted. Well, first the, the soil was limed, so it was neutralized uh, from very low pH and up to a pH where a forest can thrive. And now you have a forest again, not of course the same forest, not an old forest, but still, this is an example of a transboundary environmental impact, type of environmental impact that we have actually addressed. So acidification was the big environmental impact when I was uh, a student, an engineering student, 
uh, that was what we talked about, acid rain. Um, and this is an example where there were big debates. What are the causes? Is it air pollution? Is these are these natural fluctuations? Is this in, you know insect attacks? What is it? Uh, this was settled. It was identified individually. It is these gases, and they were targeted by regulation. Uh, re emissions of these gases was reduced by around 70% on average across Europe. And uh, acidification is now not a big problem in Europe anymore. It is a big problem in China at the moment, and this is reflecting the regional aspect of it. So what they emit in China does not affect ecosystems here and vice versa. Um, but it's also an interesting story, I think, to remember when we think about what can we do for, you know, with climate change, is it possible at all and so forth. This is an example. Actually, stratospheric ozone depletion or degradation is another example uh, where the problem was tackled globally. Uh, of course, much simpler to tackle than climate change. But still, I think it's important to remember uh, that uh, there are actually examples in history that we have succeeded. And then we have some local environmental impacts, uh, the clearing of land, the loss of soil and habitats are examples of this. Uh, this is an open pit mine in, uh, in California. Um, the depletion of water resources is another example. These are very local in nature. Actually, if you have sufficient many of them, uh, you will see them spread. They can act together. So you see if you clear land forest or rainforest in very many small uh, plots, you, you can actually see a change in the regional climate regulation around the tropical forest. Uh, but in basic, basically of nature, the, the mechanisms behind them is local. And we can now calculate the environmental impacts for each exchange from all the many processes along the life cycle and express them for the whole life cycle of the product. And we have a metric to do that in. We, we um, across all the different environmental impact, we can do a normalization that I'll briefly describe to you afterwards. And then we can express all these impacts in person equivalents. Uh, a person equivalent is the annual impact from an average person. So how much climate change do we cause each of us? How much acidification? How much stratospheric ozone depletion and so forth? Um, and uh, and you can see uh, examples of this here. You can see person equivalents. This is back from 2010. Uh, we have actually newer numbers, but they haven't changed much, unfortunately. If you look at climate change, I think we're down globally now on seven point something tons of CO2 equivalent per person. Um, but um, but these are examples of 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 the impacts that you that you have uh, per person per year in the different impact categories. And you can see that they are expressed in very, uh, very different metrics. So climate change is expressed in CO2 equivalents, ozone depletion and CFC 11 equivalents. You can't express them in CO2 equivalents because CO2 is not an ozone depleting gas. So you have different units here. And this is one of the challenges also when you do your life cycle assessment and you do this uh, modeling of the environmental impact, we call it characterization. When you do that, you end up with this kind of profile. So you have two, two alternatives that you're comparing here, A and B, and, uh, and you can see that you have uh, different uh, results here for the different impact categories for the two in very different units, and you just cannot compare across. You can compare whether A is better than B for global warming, for acidification, for photochemical ozone formation, and so forth, but you cannot really get the overall picture. And in order to do that, uh, we perform a normalization in LCA. So what we do is that we relate the impacts of what we are looking at, our product system, we relate that to the impact from an average person. And we do that by calculating a normalized impact score as the impact score from our system divided by the person equivalent for that impact category J. So we have a table here with uh, the normalization references from before, and then we can take the impact from our product and we can take the person equivalent and then we can calculate what is then the normalized impact score. And that allows you to show all the impacts on a common uh, bar diagram like this expressed as person equivalents. That does not mean that you can just sum up all the reds and sum up all the blues and compare the numbers because uh, the fact, I mean, that one person equivalent global warming and one person equivalent acidification are not necessarily equally important. 
the damage and the damage resulting from an average person's annual impact on climate change is much higher than the damage from an average person's impact on acidification, for instance. So you need some kind of interpretation weighting where you say how serious is one person equivalent for each of these. But you can at least see are they, you know, in the same order of magnitude when we compare them to this external reference, which is the annual impact from our overall activities, basically, in this case, expressed per person. So this actually concludes what I was going to tell you about LCA. So I would like to just summarize here in one slide. The do What we do in life cycle assessment is we define our goal and scope. We scope our system, we analyze the system, we collect the data about input and output from all the different processes in the life cycle. We get a huge inventory of environmental exchanges that we then translate into environmental profiles of our two solutions. So the characteristic features of LCA, I think a fundamental thing here is the holistic perspective that you have both in terms of covering the whole life cycle, so it's really a systems perspective, the whole life cycle from cradle to grave all relevant environmental impacts and resource consumption, biotic and abiotic. I haven't talked about that here, but of course that's an, an important part of the impact assessment as well. How do we compare the use of different resources to each other? It's not just environmental impacts, it's also access to resources. You can say LCA has three what we call areas of protection, things that we do the LCA to protect. It's environmental health, ecosystem functioning, it's human health, by exposure in the environment and its resources. So these are the three areas of protection in a in a classical uh, life cycle environmental life cycle assessment. So resources are in there and often working environment is also in because for human health it's important and it's related to the life cycle of your product. We aggregate the impacts over both time and space. We sum up emissions that occur in very different locations. We sum up CO2 emissions in China with CO2 emissions in Belgium and CO2 emissions in Chile. Um, and we also sum up emissions that occur at different points in time. So some emissions take place when metals are mined, for instance, raw materials are extracted or produced. Some take place when the product is produced. Some take place while it's used. So if it has a long use, uh, use stage, it can use electricity maybe over 10 years and we sum up the emissions over that whole period of time. And also when it's disposed of it, if, if it ends up in a landfill, it can continue emitting for centuries in principle afterwards. All of this is just summed. This is very special for LCA. Uh, and it also gives us some challenges uh, when we want to interpret the results. The life cycle is global. And for climate change, this is fine uh, that we sum up the emissions because it is a global type of impact as I talked about before. But for acidification, it is not. For ecotoxicity, it is not. It's different ecosystems that are being exposed uh, to the chemicals and we just sum them up. And this of course means something for how we can interpret uh, the uh, the impact scores we get out of it. And then finally, we have this focus on services on the functional unit. So LCA is not really about environmental assessment of products, it's environmental assessment of services. Uh, but of course we start focusing on the functional unit, this quantification of the service that we we want provided by what we're looking at that ensures that the comparison is fair and relevant. And based on that, we identify what are then the products we want to compare. So how many liters of the thin paint and of the thick, higher quality paint is it relevant to compare? That was determined based on the definition of the functional unit. And LCA is also very much used for comparative purposes. So relative statements, is it better to do the A or B or where in the life cycle do the main impacts occur? Are the impacts from the use stage larger than the impacts from the production stage, for instance, if you want to focus your ego design? And that brings us back to the question from before. How, trans how important are transport and packaging, actually? Now we know how to do an LCA, so let's do one. Here, from a wonderful study, if you're interested in food life cycle assessment, a big uh, review uh, of many, many studies ac across the planet. They start out with 1500 studies and then they slim it down and, and make them comparable. But uh, but these uh, results here represent, I mean, more than 300 uh, LCAs performed different places of the, on, on the planet. 
uh, different ways of producing, but looking at different food items. And you can see here, this is uh, farmed crustaceans, cheese, pig meat, fish, poultry meat, and eggs. So this is all uh, animal-based foods, if you like. But here you can see the different uh, stages of the life cycle. So there's some land system change, you change the land in order to cultivate what you need for feeding the crustaceans, not so much, but for feeding the pigs, for instance, quite a lot. And then you produce your crops, that's the light green, and you raise your animals. If you have animals in here and you have in all these cases here, you process it, you slaughter them, you transport and you pack it. So we have the packaging here, that is the dark brown, or the retail is the darkest brown, but this allows you to see how important is packaging actually. And you can see packaging is actually quite insignificant, both when we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions and fresh water for all these types of food. So if you, in your zeal to re you reduce the environmental impacts of packaging, re reduce the packaging beyond the point where it starts inducing food waste, there is a problem. I mean, if you just induce a little more need for production of fish, farmed fish or pig meat or cheese, uh, because you reduce your packaging, you've done a poor job in terms of eco-efficiency. You get higher greenhouse gas emissions because you induce something that costs much more impact than the impact you save. Okay, let's come back to the sustainability challenge. Factor three improvements by 2030, remember? And, and of course, much more towards 2050 because if you recall the uh, reduction uh, graphs that were, we needed to, to, to be aligned with the Paris Agreement, they all go to, towards zero in 2050, and maybe even negative after that. Is that at all realistic? We'll take a look at this. This is a develop, historically observed developments in efficiency. In this case, it's the energy efficiency. It's not the eco-efficiency, so it's not the environmental impact, but it's the use of energy. Uh, per delivered service. In this case, we're looking at lighting technologies. So we're looking at lumen, how much light flux do we get out of our lighting source? And how has that evolved over time historically from back around 1800 and, and until today? Um, the energy efficiency in lumen per watt is very closely related to the eco-efficiency um, that, um, that we were talking about uh, in the LCA and where we need to increase by a factor three in 10 years. Uh, from going, in this case, from candles to uh, incandescent bulb to compact fluorescent tubes and now to LED lamps uh, today, we can see that we've seen quite a dramatic increase. Actually, if we show it on a semi-logarithmic plot, we can see that what we're dealing with here is actually a uh, an exponential development, right? You have a straight line in a semi-logarithmic plot. You have a doubling time around uh, 20 years, I believe it is. And you can see that you, in this uh, 250 uh, years period or so, have seen a factor 1500 or more than a factor 1500 increase, so not a factor three, a factor 1500. So a factor three is actually not a lot because it's in 10 years, so it is a challenge, but still. And we see similar uh, developments for other technologies. Sorry, um, you probably know about Moore's law about computers, the density of transistors and uh, integrated circuit boards that doubles every two years, uh, leading to a similar increase in the efficiency of the computers. Power consumption goes down per delivered service. And we know this kind of exponential development for many types of technologies, fundamental technologies that then drive technology development in other fields as well. So there's a big potential. But if we look at the example of lighting technology and stay with that, we can see that how has the consumption then developed in the same period? And there's a super interesting study here where the authors have reviewed a lot of different studies of lighting, different, uh, different geogra geographies, different points in time. So each bubble here represents one, one location at one point in time. And you can see a lot of wonderful old uh, uh, UK industrialization studies, but then the rest of the world kicks in here as well, on grid, off grid, and so forth. Um, and what you see is this is a double logarithmic plot uh, showing the relationship between, in this location at this point in time, the ability to purchase light. So, what was the gross domestic product of the region and what was the cost of light? So, how much light could they buy? 
on the one axis and on the on the y axis the consumption of light how much light did they actually use how many uh, pizza lumen hours per year and then you see a remarkably linear uh, relationship here of course it is double logarithmic plot but still this is quite surprising i would say what you see is that over the past centuries and up to this date we spent about 0.72 percent of gdp on light and then 0.54% of GDP on the consumption of energy associated with light. I hope you find this surprising. At, at least I just demonstrated for you that in the same period of time, the efficiency of our lighting technologies had gone up by a factor of 1500. And nonetheless, we continue to spend the same fraction of our economy on light, despite the fact that it has in this period become more than a factor of 1500 times more efficient in providing light. So you might naively think that we would spend less. And actually it's 0.72% of a GDP that has in the same period also grown strongly, if not exponentially, at least in some periods. So what goes on? Well, what happens is what is called the rebound effect. Uh, because when I analyzed the iPad equation for you, uh, I actually misled you a little because I analyzed it as if the three factors P, A, and T are independent. But the consumption, in this case, the affluent and the efficiency, the technology factors are not always independent. Actually, they are very often not independent. Uh, if you have a car or if your car becomes more efficient, you buy a new car that's more efficient, so has a better mileage, you drive more. So statistically, the improvement in the mileage of the cars, the um, the uh, fuel efficiency of the car is neutralized by an increased consumption. And this is very often the case that we see that increase in, in efficiency is neutralized, it's eaten up by an increase in consumption. Sometimes this increase in consumption is even drive, driven by the increase in efficiency, like my example with the car. And this means that A times T remains constant, or maybe even grow leading to a higher impact, in spite of the technology factor improving the eco-efficiency going up. And this is what led us uh, 10, 12 years ago to realize, after having seen for many, many years how the eco-efficiency of technologies just go up and up, they just become more and more efficient, uh, and still the overall development go in the other direction. We see worse uh, climate change impact, we see a biosphere, integrity or biodiversity crisis and so forth. That LCA is a strong tool to assess eco-efficiency, but that is not enough. So LCA supports this kind of relative assessment. Is it more sustainable or more eco-efficient to do this or that? So on a scale from higher to lower impact, you move towards lower impact for the same functionality, you get the same functionality or maybe even higher with less in the impact. So this is what you see. But it doesn't tell you whether it's sustainable. Is it something we could sustain? It doesn't tell us where is the boundary beyond which the activity becomes unsustainable. So what is sustainable in absolute terms? Where's the limit between what's sustainable and unsustainable? And how can we say something about that? And this is what has led us to uh, define absolute sustainability. Uh, and as was mentioned, I'm I'm, I'm uh, leading a center here at DTU called Center for Absolute Sustainability. We define that paraphrasing the Brundtland Commission's uh, definition of a sustainable development as meeting the needs of present and future generations within the biophysical boundaries of our climate and ecosystems. That is, if you think back on the presentation that you had given by uh, Catherine Richardson, I haven't seen it, but I've seen other presentations uh, by her. She's a, a close colleague. Um, and uh, if you think about the, the planetary boundaries, we have this uh, notion of the safe operating space. And that is exactly what we're talking about here. We are respecting the biophysical boundaries of our climates, regulation system in the case of planetary boundaries, but also more broadly our ecosystems. We are inside the safe operating space. So absolute sustainability meet, means meeting needs inside this space. This is what the Brundtland Commission talks about when it says 
uh, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Because of course, if you do not respect the safe operating space, if you destabilize the climate regulation, you destabilize the functioning of the ecosystems, maybe inducing their collapse, uh, you do indeed compromise the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And we see that happening now uh, with climate change. And this is what led us to start looking into absolute environmental sustainability. And actually, you can say it is it is actually a pleonasm. It is a, it, you, you shouldn't have to talk about absolute sustainability because sustainability is in itself an absolute concept. Either it's something is sustainable or it's not sustainable. Uh, you know, either you can sustain it or you cannot sustain it. Uh, but the way sustainability is used, we're talking about sustainable transport, sustainable diet, sustainable houses, sustainable this and that. And it typically just means that it's it's relative. It's better than something else you could think of comparing it to, but it doesn't relate to it's sustainable in absolute terms. And in order to determine that, we need to know what is a sustainable level of impact. So if we take the Brundtland Commission's definition, it's about fulfilling needs of present generations, of future generations. But it doesn't talk about which needs. So here you have the Maslow uh, pyramid, the hierarchy of needs. You have some fundamental basic needs, physiological needs, the nutrition. If you don't, if you're not getting your nutritional needs uh, covered, you will eventually die. Water, if you don't have water for a few days, you will die. Safety needs, of course, are also basic needs. And then you have higher levels of needs, psychological needs, belonging, love, esteem and self-fulfillment needs and and the Brundtland Commission's definition of meeting the needs doesn't talk about what is needs here and what is wants so it's difficult to base uh, base it on that actually it doesn't also doesn't tell us how to fulfill them or for how many of course what is sustainable a sustainable way of fulfilling needs and maybe even wants on a planet with uh, 10, 000, uh, 10, 10 million uh, inhabitants uh, is not uh, is not necessarily sustainable uh, on a planet with 10 billion inhabitants. And this has led to this other approach where we say maybe we could take a top-down approach to defining the boundaries. So for instance, looking into the planetary boundaries and their top-down prescription of sustainable level in, of impact. This is where the, the, the three pillars of sustainability economic, the social and, and, and the environmental people, planet profit, are not seen as mutually exchangeable. This is a soft definition of sustainability, but actually saying, well, we have some limits that are posed by Earth's life support system. It's a very anthropocentric way of defining the environment, that it's, it's there to support our life. And that's the thinking in sustainability. But there are some limits there. Human societies need to respect them. They are nested inside this. And if they do not respect that, uh, then we are undermining uh, the societies themselves. Then we may have collapses of human societies because we don't respect these absolute boundaries. So there are absolute boundaries for what is environmentally sustainable. And this is what the planetary boundaries is one approach to addressing. And I'm so glad that uh, Catherine took you through this, so I'll not have uh, to to explain this to you, this is from the, the latest paper uh, that uh, Catherine uh, Richardson actually uh, uh, first authored, uh, where you can now see uh, actually uh, all of the boundaries are made operational and six of them are transgressed according to the metrics that has been defined. This relationship between a control variable that measures our pressure in the environment and a response variable uh, that uh, shows the response of the in environment uh, or of this uh, uh, Earth system process that we're talking about uh, as in their terminology. Uh, and, and you can see the safe operating space being in the green zone here. As long as we respect the planetary boundary, we are quite sure that we have not passed the tipping point or threshold that will lead to much stronger responses in, uh, in the environment state. So this is very nice. But remember, I come from the LCA world and the LCA world we are operating with these impact categories that, that I talked briefly about before. Uh, at midpoint, we call them in the impact pathway, climate change, ozone depletion, human toxicity, and so forth. And they are different from what we operate with in the planetary boundaries. So how can we address that? Well, there are two approaches that we have followed. One of them is to say, 
let's take the thinking of the plant trip boundary, this idea that there are absolute environmental uh, boundaries that we need to respect and then see, can we determine them for these midpoint impact categories? So what we're talking about is that we are uh, we are identifying uh, or we, 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 we are finding out what is a sustainable level of impact for each of these impact categories that we normally address in the LCA. So you saw them before, we can take them on towards the areas of protection I mentioned before, the human health, natural environment, natural resources that we call endpoints. Uh, but but for each of them, we can go in and say, what is a permissible impact per average person? So is there a carrying capacity defined as a level of impact of uh, impact for acidification, for instance, uh, that allow us to not see uh, irreversible changes in this in the structure and the functioning of the ecosystem? So what is the what is the tolerance level or critical load? It's called for acidification, for instance. What's the critical load? How much can we allow ourselves to emit of these nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides without exceeding uh, the resilience of the ecosystems, the ability of the ecosystems to, to absorb and neutralize the impact that they are exposed to? That's what we call the permissible impact. And we can do that per average person, just like we did, if you remember the normalization references that we use in life cycle assess impact assessment, the person equivalent, that was the current level of impact per average person. Now, this is not the current level of impact. This is the permissible impact per average person. And if we can uh, calculate them, we could also use them as normalization references in life cycle impact assessment. So basically, what we do is we say we have this thinking, we have a carrying capacity, a tolerance level of the ecosystem, and there is an operating space inside. So we're not in LCA operating with the safe operating space of the planetary boundaries because there is a level of recaution here because we're taking into account the uncertainty around the threshold. And that's a, a precautionary approach that we normally don't take in LCA because in LCA we are comparing impacts in many different categories. And if we are precautionary, and take safety uh, factors in, then we inherently bias the comparison between the different impacts. So what we're interested in is to, is to know what is the best estimate of where the threshold is, and that is then the space that we're looking at. And that space we can take, that's the carrying capacity, and we can divide it by the number of people, and we can calculate an annual personal impact budget like this. So here are the current capacities that we have that we have chosen to define. So you can see, for instance, for climate change, it's two degree. Actually, that's in the Paris Agreement as well, as one uh, boundary, not exceeding two degrees. Uh, but there's also another one which is more affiliated with the 350 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's a radiative forcing increase of one watt per square meter, and you'll see the planetary boundaries also actually operate with both of them. But we have also defined for the other impact categories, all of them impact categories that we use <clears throat> in LCA, in traditional LCA. And that allows us now, in addition to our current level of impact, to define sustainable level of impact person equivalents that you can see here. And uh, you can see that for some of the impact categories, actually the current impact does not exceed the sustainable level of impact. The bold ones here, it does, in climate change example, by about an order of magnitude. So with these normalization references, what we can do is that we can uh, we can take the um, uh, impact of the product and we can normalize it with a sustainable impact. But in order to do that, uh, we need, of course, first to find out how big a share of that space that we have per person should we allocate to our product? So basically what we've done is now we've said, what is the what what can the planet tolerate or the regional ecosystem if we're regional impact categories? What can it tolerate? How much space does that give for each of us? And then we need to find out how do we then upscale that? How do we take that up per product, for instance? Or it could be that we are looking at something else than products, nations. What is the tolerable level of impact this nation can have or this sector? dairy sector, for instance, or this household. So we can scale to different. And the way of sharing the, or allocating, as we also call it, the operating space, is something that we've also, uh, it's a central thing of, of absolute sustainability assessment, because basically 
you need to find out where are the limits, what is the operating space we have, and how do we share it between different activities if we want to talk about whether this is a sustainable way of meeting the dietary needs of the population. We need to find out how big a share of the operating space for climate change, for eutrophication, for acidification, can we assign to the um, to this activity, to, to the diet, because we also want to have houses so we can uh, have shelter. We also want transportation. Uh, there are many things we need. We want clothes. So how do we share the same, the, the safe operating space? And these are different principles and I cannot go through all of them. I can just tell you that they give very different results. The first one, equal per capita is egalitarian. That's basically say, we all have the same share. There's a, for climate change globally, it's global because it's a global impact. Uh, there is this total space, we share it equally. 8.2 billion people, how much is the safe space for each of us? This is what we did here um, in getting to these numbers. But that of course can be questioned because you can say that uh, some places on the planet, we have a higher capability to reduce than in others. We have much higher impacts at the moment. We have also caused much higher impact. That's what reflected in the historical debt. Say, so hey, but we already had our share. There are big parts of India, Africa, Southeast Asia that has not caused a lot of impact until now, among other things, because they have not built the infrastructure that we have invested climate change impact in building. They don't have the hospitals. They don't have the roads. They don't have all this infrastructure. And that means that they have a right to pollute more than we have to be able to build some of the same things to meet the needs of their populations today. And these are uh, both, this is historical debt, but also the capability to, re to reduce because we have built all, all this infrastructure. Uh, we have a capability to reduce. We are able to reduce our impacts much more because we don't need to build new infrastructure, for instance. We could stop building and we would still be quite well off compared to others that haven't built yet. Uh, we can convert our uh, uh, energy systems because we have the funds to do it. Grandfathering is an important one as well. Grandfathering, also called status quo, is the one that is used in the science-based targets. I don't know if you're familiar with that or I've talked about that, but this is a system that companies can uh, adapt uh, to if they uh, want to be part of the solution, if you want. So, if you want. so this is a uh, a non-governmental international organization uh, that is allowing companies to go in and register their ambition to reduce their climate change impacts in accordance with the uh, traject emission trajectories into the future uh, under the Paris Agreement. So what is needed to meet the Paris Agreement and uh, uh, how much do we then need to reduce um, per year until 2050 and so forth. And companies can go in and say and document we emit so much today and our ambition is 2030 to reduce by this much and uh, 2040 by this much and so forth uh, and then document what they're doing. So, so sciencebasedtargets.org, um, you take a look at it, it's very interesting. More than 5,000 companies at the moment, big ones, many of them registered on this, committed to doing this. Uh, and, and basically the thinking there is what's called grandfathering. What you do is you get a share that is proportional with the impact that you had in a reference year. So if you were a big emitter in the reference year, you will continue to be a big emitter also in the future because everybody just shrink proportionally, right? So if you caused 1% of the global impact uh, in the reference year, let's say 2020, you will still cause 1% of the impact in 2030. However, the total impact will be reduced by 45 or 50%. But this is, uh, this is what's called grandfathering. And uh, and this is what is actually adopted in practice in the science-based targets. There are a lot of things to be said about uh, the reason, uh, how, how, how reasonable it is to do it in that way. It, there's a lot of injustice in it, but it's actually accepted by companies to do it. I mean, one injustice is that if you are a laggard, you haven't done anything so far, so you have a big impact today, uh, then you get a, a big share. Whereas if you have really worked on this for 15 years and you've picked all the low hanging fruits and you have optimized your climate change efficiency as much as you can, when you join the initiative, you get a small uh, space to start with, with and you have a much bigger challenge in reducing further because you already picked the low hanging fruits. So this is just one example. 
But there are different principles here, and and when we go back, we need, of course, uh, when we uh, uh, use our uh, sustainable impact for normalization in, in in LCA and say how how big a part of the acceptable impact from an average person is caused by this product, uh, we need to say okay, and how big a share can the product actually claim? So how how should we share this? Uh, uh, what can you say, allowance, if you want to call it that, this person equivalent, this sustainable person equivalent, how should we share that between products? This was taking the absolute perspective into LCA, but we could also take LCA into the absolute perspective, and we also did that. So what we did was we said, let's be inspired by LCA and then take that into the planetary boundary world. So we developed this uh, paper that you can see Catherine Richardson is, is, is co-authoring. She was a co-supervisor of the PhD who did the work where we try to use this impact pathway thinking that we have an LCA and we try to put that over the science that is behind the planetary boundaries for each of the Earth system processes, you know, uh, to try to apply LCA thinking on that. And that then leads us to um, a new LCA method called PBLCA planetary boundary LCA uh, that we uh, have developed and, and that's actually uh, quite used for as assessing whether something is sustainable in absolute terms. And I would like to conclude my lecture here by showing you an example of this, uh, an example that was done by Morten Rüberg, who was a, a PhD student who, who developed the method, and that we did in collaboration with uh, some researchers from uh, Unilever uh, that were uh, interested in knowing about the sustainability in absolute terms of laundry washing. So, so Unilever produced, as you know, probably know a lot of different uh, food products, but also a lot of household uh, chemicals and detergents and so forth. And in this study, we looked into uh, laundry washing in Europe in 2018. So what we did was we did a life cycle assessment on laundry washing the annual laundry washing in Europe. So our functional unit was the washing of laundry in Europe in one year. And um, we did an LCA on that. So what are the impacts using this PB LCA method? What are the impacts for the earth system processes that we have in, in, in the planetary boundary approach? Uh, what were the impacts that it cost? to produce the, 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 the laundry machine, the washing machine, uh, or rather a share of it, of course, because it lasts more than one year. The water that's used for washing, the electricity that's used for heating the water and running the machine, uh, the uh, production of the detergents, uh, all of that. What are the impacts associated with that? And then we said, what is the safe operating space? We could take that from the planetary boundaries for each of the Earth's system processes. And then we said, okay, and how large a share of that safe operating space can we then assign to laundry wash. And that then gives us an allowable impact. So now we have the actual impact of laundry washing and the allowable impact of laundry washing. And the ratio between these two, we call the absolute sustainability ratio of laundry wash. And if that ratio is higher than one, it means that the actual impacts of laundry washing, according to our LCA, is higher than the allowable according to the way that we have uh, allocated the safe operating space between different activities. That means it's unsustainable. But if the ratio is lower than one, it means the impacts are lower than the assigned share, the allowable share, and then it is sustainable in absolute terms. Um, now, we did the actual practice in 2018 when the paper was done. Uh, for laundry washing, but Unilever also identified six different eco design scenarios, they called them improvement options. So we could, supposing that the electricity was produced by uh, wind, renewable energy, purely wind, uh, that would, you know, of course, reduce the impact from laundry washing. Supposing that uh, people only dosed the amount of washing powder that they were supposed to and not uh, more than that. Supposing that we washed at 20 temperature, uh, 20 degrees uh, on average instead of, I don't know, whatever, 30 is the European standard. Supposing that we sourced the palm oil for our detergents in a day or for the detergents in a different way and so forth. So six scenarios. And what I'll show you now are the results for the baseline. That's scenario number one. And then a scenario number eight, that is the baseline. 
plus each of the six scenarios, improvement scenarios, everything combined in one. So the results look like this. Remember, we have the sustainability, absolute sustainability ratio on the y-axis. This is logarithmic, right? So one times 10 to zero is one. So this dashed line is the uh, absolute sustainability uh, limit, if you like. And then the dot is the result uh, of uh, the uh, LCA uh, impacts divided by the uh, allocator or assigned share of the safe operating space. And then we have some uncertainty ranges around it. And then you can see uh, along the x-axis, we have scenario number one and scenario number eight. And for each of them, uh, we have four different allocation principles. The first one is EU per capita and final consumption expenditure. So first, what we do is we say, what is the safe operating space for climate change in a gem imbalance? It's global, for all planetary boundaries, it's global. So we then divide that between number of inhabitants equally, so the equal per capita, and that gives EU, based on our population count in EU, 5% of the global safe operating space. So that first, the operating safe operating space for, for, for EU, and then we say, okay, but how large a share of this is then for laundry washing? And we base that on final consumption expenditure. So that's based on our spending. How much money do we spend on wa washing clothes or buying electricity for washing clothes or water or washing machines? How much do we spend on that? And how big a share is that? Is that of our total spending in Europe? So if we spend uh, whatever, one per mil of our total spending on, on activities associated with washing clothes, then washing of clothes gets one per mil of the total space. So that's the first one. The second one is status quo. That's what I also call grandfathering. So that's simply saying laundry washing globally, how large a share of the total climate change impact does that cause? And that is the share that it gets of the safe operating space of Europe, or, or, or in this case. And then just fine consumption expenditure, how large is the global spending on laundry washing uh, and how large a share is that of the global economy and that is the share that it gets here and so forth eu per capita and gross value added is related to uh, similar to the first one and what you can see here is that it is not sustainable the way we are washing clothes at the moment that's scenario one and scenario eight shows you that it's also not sustainable even if we implement all six eco design options uh, except in the case where we use the grandfathering, where it actually gets below the ratio of one. And if you look at all the other impact categories that we were able in 2018 to operationalize under the uh, uh, planetary boundaries, you'll see this tends to be the picture. There are some of the impact categories like, oh, sorry, um, uh, Earth system processes is the planetary boundary terminology, uh, like stratospheric ozone depletion, where it nearly regardless your allocation principle is sustainable in absolute terms. Also, some of the land system changes and freshwater uses uh, are there. But you can say, what's then the use of this? I mean, it, it seems to be very dependent on the allocation principle and so forth. I think when I'm out and, and, and demonstrate, or talking about this and, and introducing uh, not least to industry, they find it very interesting uh, because it tells you not just what is more sustainable, but what is sustainable in absolute terms. And also for Unilever in this case, it tells you that even with the six options for eco design that they could think of here or hey, had thought of here is still not enough. So we need to go other ways. We need to look to other types of solutions if we want to, if this to become sustainable for climate change and for many of the other categories as well. And I think this is an important information for companies because we can improve on anything. We are engineers, at least I am, and, and, and we optimize that. I mean, that's the nature of our work. We do things better. Uh, but the point is that we need to know which things it is that we should be, we should be improving. Uh, it's been said by, by the, the um, cradle to cradle people, this eco design concept, you know, relative relative sustainability is about doing things right. Eco efficiency is about doing things right. So you shouldn't waste. You know, you should do the things right. But sustainability is also about doing the right things. And this 
can help us finding out what are the right things to do, and at least what are not the right things to do, or the things that just do not have the potential to ever become sustainable in absolute terms. So summarizing, sustainability requires very strong increases in the eco-efficiency of our technologies, and we use LCA to analyze that and to cover all relevant environmental impacts. It's not just climate change. We have the full life cycle perspective, the many processes in the life cycle, as you recall, to avoid problem shifting to between uh, uh, stages of the life cycle, between impact categories. We look at all relevant environmental impacts to avoid that we maybe address a climate change impact at the expense of a land use impact. And uh, we take an iterative approach. So we start with a screening and then we provide more detail where it is most important until we're able to answer the question of RLCA or the, the goal definition of RLCA. And we need to move from better to good enough by introducing an absolute sustainability perspective. So eco-efficiency is about better, but good enough is about what are the right things to do? What are the things that actually will allow us uh, to meet the needs uh, within the biophysical limits? And that is what sustainable consumption and production could be defined as, meeting the needs of present and future generations while respecting the planet's biophysical limits. And that concludes what I had planned to talk to you about. And now I'm very curious to hear if you have any questions.